SJ, welcome to Muskogee Radio, your weekly source for tribal and community news, interesting guests and discussions, plus a local events calendar. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is Darren DeLon. Welcome to Muskogee Radio. Uh, as you know, uh, Gary Fife will, is uh, have taken another uh, episode off. Uh, he uh, had surgery a few weeks back, and he's uh, recovering. Um, and from what I've been talking to him, he's doing pretty well. So uh, keep recovering. Uh, just a reminder, Gary, that everything's okay here. We're all doing fine, and uh, we miss you. Can't wait for you to come back. Uh, just wanting to make a mention. I mean, uh, if you know that if you hear my voice, my voice is not a radio voice, none whatsoever. If y'all were listening to Tradio earlier, Brooks Brewer has a very good voice. I was just listening to that, and just everything was just like moving, flowing, even with everybody calling in. You know, he just kept kept moving along, kept going along. It's amazing, and even with um, even with um, like uh, just uh, how he can um, do that over and over. I'm still a work in progress. I figure I'm going to be a work in progress for a long time. So I mean, just you know, listening to Gary Five, you know, listening to Brooks Brewer, and listening to a while to uh, Stan the Joke Man. I mean, these guys are, they come from all walks of life, but they're also, you know, they have a great voice. And uh, so I hope uh, y'all take the time out of y'all's day. If y'all want to listen to Tradio, you know, just uh, hear how Brooks talk. It's amazing. I, I, I just like, we'll sit there and just watch him for a little while. I mean, Gary, the same way. Oh, man. Uh, well, what a Wednesday morning. Well, thank you. Uh, there's Brooks right there. There's my technical producer right there. Um, my my morning started off, of course, like kind of like last last week, you know, chicken with the head cut off. But this morning was kind of different. It was, uh, believe it or not, my voice was gone. About <laughs> I woke up about 5.30, you know, and I contemplate about getting up. I'll hit snooze about four or five times, and uh, then I'll get up. Well, whenever I, like, yawned uh there was no uh there was a air that i exhaled but no voice or nothing like that came so that was scary for a little bit i mean i remember just like trying to start uh for like 10 minutes i didn't have a voice and after about i started gargling with salt water and then after that my voice started coming back but it sounded like i was 13 again <laughs> it sounded like yeah it was it was actually it was kind of nervous i was worried about that i was like what am i gonna do am i gonna have somebody like take up for the show for me but luckily you know with everybody at Muskogee Media and for Muskogee Radio we're always covered and we always got people there that are going to do it uh be able to do it be able to fill in just in case so but luckily as you can tell my voice is back thank goodness um another uh cool thing I saw today on my way over here to uh, Muskogee Radio to uh, 1240 The Brew um I saw this uh little family um it was a mom and a little girl and um I guess they had, uh, she had a little like a uh, carriage uh, or a stroller, not carriage, a stroller just walking uh, walking along. And, but her little daughter uh, got out, wanted to get out and uh, wanted to uh, just start walking with her mom. And what was the funny thing about it was uh, after uh, we saw her, uh, she got, uh, she was taking, uh, taking her out of the stroller, she wanted to push the stroller. And uh, I, I, of course, I was like just washing away and it was, um, so cute because she was asking her mom, mom, get in the stroller. <laughs> she wanted to do it for her mom. I think from what I could guess, you know, maybe she, her mom always pushes her in the stroller. Maybe she wanted to give her mom a break or maybe she wanted to, uh, you know, just uh, see what it's like pushing the stroller. But it was the cutest little thing in the world because, uh, you know, after that, her mom just laughed, picked her up, you know, gave her a big old hug. And uh, I remember like before, uh, just listening to him, like her mom says, "No, I got it. I'll, 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 I'll do this." And it was, a, it was a wonderful sight to see. I, I, I truly enjoy that. And it's some of the uh, greatest things that you do when you stop and you just, you know, just enjoy the moment for a little bit. And um, that's one, and that's one thing I got to see this morning. So I really did enjoy that a lot. Well, that was my morning, my losing my voice, and then also seeing. Uh, a little girl tried to reverse roles with her mom. Uh, but we have a great, great show for y'all today. Uh, we have um, 
Our first off will be an Oklahoma minister. Uh, I'm reading the headline here. Oklahoma minister organizes a Native American prayer rally in D.C. offering forgiveness to the nation. Well, the Oklahoma minister is here with us today, and he's going to be t talking to us about what's going to be going on. His name is Reverend Nigel Big Pond. He's from the Morning Star Church of All Nations. And then also later on, uh, we're going to have a phone interview with uh, a gentleman by the name of Terrell Hill, and he had a book just uh, recently published, and it's going to be out here pretty soon, and we're going to be talking about that book. Very close friend of mine, very good friend of mine, and um, um, so uh, we're going to be looking forward to that, and uh, we're going to take a little short break, and uh, after when we come back, we'll be uh, speaking to uh, Reverend Nigel Big Pond. So uh, please stick around to Muskogee Radio. I started doing it when I was 11. I wanted to be just like my big brother. And some of my friends were already doing it. We got hooked fast. I just can't get enough. I'm Jacob, and I'm addicted to playing the drums. There's lots of stuff that makes it cool to be Native. Doing meth isn't one of them. Find something better to do. Check out NCAI.org. A message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. One Fire Casino in Altmulgee offers Ladies' Day every Monday with $5 match play, VIP days for seniors on Tuesdays, lunchtime match plays on Wednesdays and Thursdays, and several other great drawings and prizes throughout the weekend. Don't forget to take advantage of spinning the wheel on Sundays to win up to $5,000 cash. Be sure to check out the daily meal specials at Council Oak Cafe. There are exciting monthly giveaways with extravagant prizes. Come and play at One Fire Casino, where it really is okay to play with fire. Welcome back to Muskogee Radio. I am your host for this episode, Darren, uh, Darren DeLon. Um, well, we're going to go ahead and get started with our first segment today. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, it is about an Oklahoma minister who is going to be organizing a Native American prayer rally in D.C. You know, he's offering uh, forgiveness to the nation. And, uh, of course, that reverend is here with us. His name is Re Reverend Nigel Bigpond. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? Good morning, Darren. It's good to be here. Thank goodness. Thank you that you're here. Uh, you know, um, of course, me and uh, Mr. Big Pond, you know, uh, Reverend Big Pond, we, um, he's a busy man. You know, we've been, uh, of course, me and him been trying to, like, schedule radio interviews, like radio recorded interviews. And, you know, sometimes I'm busy, sometimes he's busy, and then sometimes it just don't uh, work. And uh, But luckily, you know, thank goodness, uh, he, uh, we uh, were able to... Uh, meet today and um good enough it's going to be on live so uh i appreciate you being here and uh, first of all uh reverend big pond please tell us a little bit about yourself or tell the audience please well um i've been in ministry for around 39 years i've uh, traveled over 198 reservations uh, i've been of course overseas in different countries as well and uh I love to play the piano, and I, I love to sing, as well as my children. They mm -hmm. do the same as well. And uh, <clears throat> i just been a, a lot involved with government. I was had the opportunity to, to bring forth uh, or get it passed. Uh, December the 10th, uh, 2010, uh, President Obama signed the, the Resolution of Apology, which, which I had the opportunity to work on for seven years. Uh, but he signed it into law. Of course, it was passed on the defense bill, which I wasn't too crazy about because it should have been on its own merit. Mm -hmm. And But unfortunately, there was never no recognition of that, and, and I don't think he's ever called the chiefs. I think he did, he did, send, let, they did send letters out to the chiefs that it was signed. Mm -hmm. But as uh, far as any getting anything out to the community or the country, uh, nothing was ever, was ever done. And so I've been working with a, a lot of Native people. I've worked with the five civilized tribes. Uh, two years ago, the five chiefs signed a bill uh, uh, making November as a national day, uh, national month of prayer. And so we, we've been going different with the intertribal. We just came from Ardmore. We had a wonderful time there. Awesome. So we just, it's all about prayer, and, you know, and, and you know, it's just been good for me. You know, uh, let's uh, backtrack a little bit. Yeah. You said you you have been a reverend for 39 years, mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, you play the piano. Mm -hmm. And um, 
if um, your church is called Morning Star Church of yeah. All Nations, where yeah. is that located at? That's in uh, big city of Hectorville, Oklahoma, <laughs> 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 or what the natives call a Duck Creek. Duck Creek. Duck, okay. Duck Creek area. Yeah, and we also have a school down there, Darren. It's called Two Rivers Native American Training Center. It's been going uh, right at 18 years. Wow. I believe it is. Yeah. Uh, what? Uh, what uh, is a what kind of school is that again? It's a, it's we we train people basically on how to pray and, and about the land and you know we have it's actually international. We've had people from Japan and, and wow. China come in, uh, just different countries, uh, uh, Germany, I believe, and uh, all tribes coming in from all different reservations and not all just native people. All, all types of people, mm -hmm. and we tra train them in the arts of prayer, how to pray, and how to, what land means to the native people. A lot of, uh, from a traditional setting as well as the, the uh, non-traditional setting about prayer. All right, you know, uh, let's uh, let's jump into that about the prayer, the prayer route that you're organizing. Mm -hmm. Can you? I mean, I know you uh, kind of like gave us a little bit of background into it um, with the uh, uh, intertribal. You know, talking mm -hmm. to the five civilized tribes then. But, you know, tell us, um, why do you feel, I mean, um, the U.S. needs this prayer? Well, the U.S. is in my, a lot of trouble mm -hmm. right now. And, uh, you know, I've been on a national prayer committee there in Washington, D.C. for uh, over 20 years, uh, uh, the executive board. But I've never seen them really uh, seek for Native help in that area of prayer. Mm -hmm. And I sat there like a good Indian and just sat there. And finally I asked the leader, I said, what about the native people? What do you? And immediately turned around and said, oh, we had one last year that had a, a lot of feathers on and danced. And, and I thought to myself, is that all we mean uh, to you is feathers and a dance? I said, we have a voice. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, uh, I, I believe it was... Uh, what in our language, I'm Yuchi, full-blooded Yuchi. Yes. And I'm fourth-generation minister, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we call him Gohanton, the one who overcomes great things in a great way. And at that point, I just began to think about it, and then about two, about a, not quite a year ago, it was dropped into my spirit that the Native people need to go to Washington, D.C. and pray which they've never been asked. This is, this is historical. Mm -hmm. So October the 21st, we went. And I thank uh, uh, Chief uh, Floyd for uh, helping us with buses and, and different things to go up there to take the Creek Nation up there as well. And uh, we was at the Washington Monument at 9 o'clock. Uh, we went to 9 to 5. And... And some of the people would say, well, why, why, the, why the Native people? And uh, if not us, I would say, if not us, who? We are more governmental people than any other nation because, you, you know, we've got our sovereignty, we've got our reservations, we've got this what we call Indian land, but it's not really Indian land. The government still is tied to it. We've, we're always dealing with the government mm -hmm. as I think as uh, – Chief Beaver of the Creek Nation said one time, he said, we used to send peace pipes to Washington, D.C. Now we send about seven lawyers because it's always a constant battle with them over land, over sovereignty, over treaties mm -hmm. and things of this nature, which they have they have uh, forgotten our treaties, seem like we're constantly battling. And so we have more authority than any other people group, whether it's the African-American or Caucasian or whoever, Hispanic, we have that authority to, to pray. And, and then they would say, if not, and I would say, if not prayer, then what? What would you do there? I mean, you, that's, we have never, our people have never given up on prayer. I, it's an honor for me to come for the Creek Council, and they ask me to come and pray, just mm -hmm. to pray. It's an honor. Of course, we pray in the beginning, which is good, because it, our people have never forgotten prayer. Mm -hmm. And... And then we pray, and of course they pray at the council, and then they go to fussing and fighting. <laughs> but at the end, they pray. Mm -hmm. You know, they get their thing done, and then they pray again. So that we've always been a people of prayer. And so that's the reason we took prayer. And then they would say, if uh, I, I would say, well, if not now, when? Mm -hmm. Well, it's just before the election. You know, we got this big election coming up with the. Uh, 
uh, Hillary Clinton and, and Donald Trump. Well, of course, we know that Donald has won. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so it was, a, it was a gravitating time. And then why the Washington Monument? We took 20 uh, tribes up there. Uh, I think it was in uh, uh, June, mm-hmm. oh, July, excuse me. And just just went over the, all the mon- all the the mall there, and went to the east, west, north, and south. And we come back together, and it was really plain to us we need to be at the Washington Monument. And so, and no one's ever done anything at the Washington Monument of this magnitude. Once again, this is historical. The native people have never gathered together. We have over 500 tribes in America. Mm-hmm. And, of course, we invited also Canada. There's 500 tribes in Canada. And so Canadian tribes came, some chiefs came. We didn't get all thousands, all uh, the thousand tribes, but this is a ongoing, yeah. uh, Darren. This will happen next year, October, and I'm going back in towards D.C., for however how long it's going to take to get this into law, that October, the third week of October, that will be proclaimed the National Day of Prayer for for the First Nation people. And so the other question is is not uh, now when and then if not Washington D.C. where well where else would we go to pray that has a problem with so many has so many problems seem like in this nation. I would like to, uh, because we have the authority there with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Department of Interior, all these things, and, and, and we even went to the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, a, a lot of Creeks were there, and our Uchi, that's with the Creek Nation, our Uchi children was there, they sung, they prayed in Uchi, and so I was really, uh, uh, happy about that. But let me real quickly, Darren, read you a uh, a prophecy. Okay. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't think our native people had prophets. They did. They call them holy people or holy man or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's how we'll probably we made it to the, through the Trail of Tears because of prophecy. Now, this guy, he's a Sioux, Lakota Sioux, and his name was Crazy Horse. Of course, he didn't get his name because he's crazy. Because he got his name because he rode a crazy horse. Mm-hmm. Let me read this real quickly. Okay. It says, The red nation will rise again, and it shall be a blessing for a sick world, a world filled with broken promises, selfishness, and separation, a world longing for light. I see a, a time of seven generations which all the colors of mankind are gathered. Now, the seven generations, that means a completion, mm-hmm. a completion. Yes. We are on our final thrust, I think. We, we went through a lot of things. We went through the land, the trail of tears, the land issues. We went through uh, uh, the wars. And, matter of fact, our people fought for this country. Uh, if it wasn't for the, the Navajo coal talkers, they wouldn't have war, won World War II. Mm-hmm. And so our people have a lot, a part of this. And then it talks about, he goes on to say, in that uh, uh, colors, uh, I see a time of seven generations when all the colors of mankind will gather under the sacred tree of life, and the whole earth will become one circle again. Now he's talking about unif- unity. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's kind of strange that, Trump, when he got when he won, that was what his fir- one of his first words was that I want we want unity into this nation. Okay, in that day there will be those who, among the native people, who carry knowledge and understanding of unity among all the living things, and the young white ones will come to to those of my people and ask for this wisdom. I see. I salute the light within your eyes where the whole universe dwells for them. And when you are at the center within you, I am in that place within me, and we shall be one. Talking about that unity again, that circle again, that circle. And so I, I took that. And then also there was another great man of the gospel called Billy Graham in 1964. Also, he, he quoted this four days before he was killed in Nebraska. At the, he was in prison. But in 1964, New Mexico, uh, Billy Graham was speaking at a, a, a conference, and he looked to the left, and he seen all these native pastors, you know, Indians, they always come together, you know. And so he seen them, and he said, your people are like a sleeping giant. 
And when, when they arise, the great awakening, awakening that we seek in this country will come. And I believe it's coming. Mm -hmm. I really believe it's coming. So that's one of the reasons uh, that we went there. And I think it's going to change a nation because we have the authority to do so. You know, with, um, you know, you're saying you want the unity and, you know, with the prophecy you're talking about, is that what you're wanting to accomplish with uh, this um, uh, prayer rally? And it sounds like you're, it's starting to go on that good way. I mean, it that is. forward because, I mean, like you say, it's going to be a yearly thing. And it's like a two-part question because, I mean, what do you want to accomplish? And also, um, how uh, are you expecting it to get bigger and bigger each year? Well, we, you know, we went there for for two purposes. One was to, to pray for a nation uh, that there would be peace come into this nation. And I think we accomplished that. Mm -hmm. uh, the t number two thing was to forgive a nation that never asked for forgiveness. You know, once again, they never come to us, even though I was a part of getting that resolution passed. They never came to us and say, would you forgive us? Mm -hmm. So we just went on our own and say, okay, we're going to forgive you regardless. You're not going to ask us, but we're going to forgive you anyway. And so we did that. And what we want to accomplish is basically what he is saying, to, to bring peace into a nation to where there was broken promises, there was selfishness, separation, uh, a world longing for light. I, I just truly believe, and it's, some people say, well, you know, you're just native people. You can't do that. Uh, I truly believe we, we can bring hope to a nation because we've never been asked before. No one has included us to do so. And this is, you know, this is our nation as well. You know, we're part of this, and we've been a part of it for years and years, and uh, our, our tribes are doing fairly well, pretty well. There was a time, even in the Great Depression, our people were pretty well doing okay because we know how to live. We know how to survive off the land, and, and a lot of people don't know that. So we want to bring peace. Matter of fact, we're going to Standing Rock uh, this Friday, mm -hmm. Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, but where they're having the pipeline problems, and a lot of things are happening there, and we want to go up there as well and pray a prayer of peace, to bring peace to the tribes and to the pipeline, whatever they can whatever they're doing or whatever they're trying to do, mm -hmm. but we want to bring peace. You know, a few more questions before we have to wrap this up. Um, one, uh, one question, you know, whenever you want to bring that, uh, that prayer of peace, uh, do you think, I don't know, you know, of course, you know, you're talking about the Standing Rock situation, mm -hmm. all the past years of uh, how the U.S. government has done um, mm -hmm. the American Indians wrong. And uh, do you think um, with this prayer, you know, y'all, y'all went up there and, Y'all uh, giving forgiveness to mm -hmm. the nation, even mm -hmm. though they haven't done anything as well. But do you think this will like help in a way start the healing process uh, of the anger or the hard feeling that the American Indians have toward the U.S. government? I think it will. It's we got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't. We we got to just stop talking about it and start doing something. Once again, we have the authority. We've never given up on prayer. Our people, uh, we we still pretty much live the way of the old way, somewhat. Uh, we have the power through prayer, and I'm going to just say it. I think we have more power than most people, mainly because you know this nation has taken prayer out of schools and prayers out of uh, you know the, the abortion issue, all kinds of things. Where our tribes pretty much stay in that scenario mm -hmm. with with God. God has directed us. God has given us the ability to, to forego and to survive. We should have been wiped off this earth. Why wasn't we? Well, because God, the creator, and we always, our people are all autonomous. They believe in God, mm -hmm. the creator. They don't believe in the monkey, the King Kong theory, or all that stuff. They just believe in God, the creator of all things. And so we have that authority. So I believe by doing this, by releasing prayer and bringing the churches together, bringing pastors together, bringing our leaders together, our tribes together, our chiefs, we, you know, I'm going to say that I, if those were 
in this voting situation, I believe we changed some things by, by going up there because there's, there's over thousands, a couple of thousand native people on that mall October the 21st from 9 to 5, and real quickly, um, they were predicting rain, 70%. And so, but we prayed that it wasn't going to rain. Now, we can do a rain dance or we can stop at either one. <laughs> so we stopped it. Uh -huh. So it was a beautiful day, but 2.30, I think it's 2.40 in the evening, there came a mighty rushing wind. I mean, it was a powerful wind came through there. And then it rained for 10, 15 minutes. Well, after that was after all we prayed and sung and everything. The Creek sung, uh, singers came and sung their songs as well. I, you know, our people believe when, the, when people die, it rains to wash away all the old past and everything, the footsteps and everything. Well, we believe it washed away a lot of things that Washington, D.C. has done. Wow. You know, we had to, unfortunately, you know, we got to wrap this up. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, I wanted to ask if, you know, I'm pretty sure, you know, after hearing this, after you doing the organization, if... If there's any, I mean, I'm, I know there's going to be some people that's going to be asking about this, mm -hmm. wanting to participate, wanting yeah. to help out in any way. Who can they, uh, how can they get a hold of you to be able to do this? They can go, to, we have a website, mm -hmm. alltribesdc.org. All right. That's one way. And then they can also call our office number 918-366-6735 because this is ongoing and we want to, uh, you know, a lot of the tribes, especially the civilized tribes, I guess they're civilized, yes. <laughs> they, they gave into this and really helped us a lot. Yes. And I appreciate that. All right. Well, the, you know, Reverend Big Pond, we want to thank you very much for being here. But before we go to commercial break, uh, there's one thing I want to ask. And, uh, you know, we had a, it was a Native American prayer rally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could you please, before we go to commercial break, could you please pray? here on the air you yes. know just you know, whatever whatever you know comes mm -hmm. to your heart you know just please pray and uh right i mean we can do that i mean you can do that right now mm -hmm. and it'll be right before we go to commercial break okay go hathany alia gone saying that go hathany well heavenly father we come to you a great one with good hearts we pray for our people we pray that they will continue to honor you, Lord. We ask that you be with the Creek Nation and all the tribes, Father, the five tribes, the 39 tribes of Oklahoma, and all the way into uh, the over 500 tribes of America and as well as Canada. We ask, Father, that, you, that they rise up in this new day, this new year, we, that they rise up and just begin to call on you more and more. We pray for our children, our young people. We come against suicide that, uh, that seems to be coming against our young people. We pray that we will live long, have long days. We pray for our tribal governments. Uh, we pray that uh, the finances will come into uh, our tribes and, and businesses will come and lands will come back to our people. We pray for this station. I pray for Darren, Father, what he does here is, is that it's just awesome and powerful. That he will continue on and that this station will continue on to, to do so. So, Father, we just pray in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Reverend Bib I want to thank you very much for being on here, taking the time out of your busy day, your busy time. Thank you. And uh, being able to talk to us about this. So, uh, well, uh, hopefully my uh, technical producer will be coming back here pretty soon. We're going to, uh, whenever he comes back in, we're going to take a quick break and we'll uh, go to uh, our next segment. And, um, but he hasn't opened the doors yet, so you're going to be hearing me for a few <laughs> more minutes. And uh, so, but um, it was, um, I guess, a couple things I can say. I mean, it was, uh, from what it sounds like, it's going to be a great thing that Reverend Big Pond is organizing with the help of all um everybody else who are uh, in participation um, that, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing that they're doing. I mean, uh, they're finally showing that, you know, a lot of, um, I guess it's like more turn the other cheek, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, we've been, you know, slapped in the face so long, mm -hmm. uh, not uh, my, our ancestors, I mean, us included, but, you know, uh, Reverend Big Pond and a lot of people that's uh, been helping him have uh, taken that step forward 
organized that prayer rally and uh you know they just offered that prayer and you know and from what it sounds like they're going to be doing some more great things at standing rock and then of course uh next year at um uh, at whenever they return back to Washington, D.C., and uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be at the Washington Monument. And I hope and pray that a lot of the leaders up there will join them. That's what I would like. I would like for the, I would love to see that, and I would love for them to mean that. And I think when they take that step there, they will mean that. So hopefully if uh, Brooks ever shows up <laughs> and he listens, maybe we can take that quick break and uh, get to uh, the next uh, segment. So uh, we're already running over uh, a little bit over schedule right now. If I could ask uh, uh, maybe uh, <laughs> Reverend Big Pond, could you uh, go out there and step out there? I really can't leave the microphone. <laughs> it's, this is like uh, comical. It always happens, especially to me on live radio. So, um, but uh, uh, he's making a rush back. Yeah, he's here. He's here. So we're going to uh, come back with Terrell Hill. We're going to take a quick, uh, short commercial break. And uh, while uh, Brooks is going to get in touch with him, and we are going to go from there. So, again, stay tuned to Muskogee Radio. Hear that? That's the sound of hope being killed by meth. Methamphetamine news is causing huge problems in our community. Hear that? That's the sound of something you can do about it. Events like rodeo, res ball, and family time can help keep kids away from meth. Talk to your kids. Keep our culture alive. A message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. Learn more at ncai.org. Who am I? Am I Indian? Just because I'm a girl from the res, don't make things up about me. What if I move away? Then who am I? Some kids try meth just to escape. But then I think about my grandma, my little brother, my beadwork, my poetry. And I think, I like who I am. And I know meth is not for me. Check out NCAI.org, a message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. Welcome back to Muskogee Radio. This is Darren DeLon. We're going into our next segment. Uh, that was uh, Reverend Nigel Big Pond earlier talking about the, he organizing the day of prayer or a prayer rally at Washington, D.C. Our next one's going to take a little bit of a turn. Uh, we are uh, talking to a uh, um, gentleman who, um, who has a book that's coming out called The Age of Myth and Legends. And uh, that gentleman is going by the name of Terrell Hill. Terrell, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me, Darren. I appreciate it. Uh, no problem. Uh, well, Terrell, let's uh, go ahead and get started into this. Um, can you give us a little of uh, background about yourself? Okay, yeah. I actually grew up in southwest Oklahoma. I'm Wichita, Kiowa, and Pawnee. Um, I had an interest in the stories uh, for a little bit, then I kind of lost interest. Like most kids, you know, my generation, you know, got caught up in video games and comic books and everything else that, that's, you know, out there to distract you. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until uh, I was actually a junior in college for uh, I had to do a sociology uh, assignment, and I had a chance to interview my grandparents. And I came away from that experience like, wow, you know, this is a lot of stuff I didn't know about our family, about our culture, you know, about our stories. And it just became a habit. I started recording my grandparents whenever I had a chance. And then uh, it just kind of it just kept going. I, I was traveling a lot, uh, playing basketball all over you know, the country. And then some of your listeners might be surprised to know that uh, you're a pretty good ball player yourself. We actually <laughs> had a chance to play in Toyak uh, a, a while back. And uh, even in Toyak, I had a chance to record and get some really good stories. So by traveling all through Indian country through basketball and uh, as a motivational speaker, you know, I've been blessed to have an opportunity to, to, to record and share, you know, the stories from everywhere, from Tahola, Washington, to as far south as, you know, Mekasuki in, in Florida, to out west in Ganado, you know, uh, up north in Red Lake, White Earth, I mean, you name it, I've probably been there, and I have some really good stories from those places. That's very, very cool to hear. I mean, yeah, I remember, you know, you um, a great basketball player, and, uh, you know, you've been all over uh, to play basketball, and also, you know, that kind of got – covered, you know, kills two birds with one stone, you're able to do that, especially because you played a lot on these reservations and these other areas. Um, you know, when, you know, when you said that, um, you got inspired by, you know, listening to your grandparents and uh, recording them, was that, um, you know, was that like the basis of, um, uh, what, how that started with your book? Yes and no. Um, <laughs> It kind of goes back even further. There was a, a series of made by Time Life Books. Um, their series was called The Enchanted World. It had really good artwork, and it was also on, on folklore mythology. Mm -hmm. And I started looking for something like that about our native culture, and I couldn't find it. 
Now, there are some good books out there, but most of those are in the realm of academia. Yeah. And uh, those books are written, to, um, they're a little dry, and they're a little too concise, and the soul of the story has been lost, you know, and, and for two reasons. I think that the people that were telling these stories to the, to the old school ethnologists and anthropologists, English was not their first language, so they didn't quite have a mastery of, of certain words. That was one reason why these stories kind of lost uh, some of their, their color. And the second reason, I think, is because the ethnologists and anthropologists didn't really have the interest in these stories, not like Greek mythology or Roman mythology or, or even you know, Norse mythology. So I wanted to create something that, that you know, would kind of fit that, 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 that hole, I guess you could say. Um, that was the beginning. And then, you know, with my grandparents' stories, it, just, it kind of came back, you know. So I think I was like in the third or fourth grade when I first came across this book. And then, you know, every third or fourth, fifth grader wants to write a book or do whatever. But mm-hmm. it was years and years later after this, this sociology assignment that I was like, hey, this is, the, this is the foundation, you know. Felt like it was the time to do it, to get it going, to get it started, get that uh, right. wheel turning. Uh, you know, uh, that kind of like, you know, like you said, how all, the, all those other books are kind of dry. It sounds similar to like, you know. American history books, you know, that, yeah. that they're teaching in our curriculum for our schools. You know, they leave a lot of stuff out. Is that what you felt, too, kind of like, kind of like something similar to that? Yes. I mean, my, my feeling has always been uh, not enough is known about our, our own stories and our own culture. Um, every kid in America knows who Hercules is, mm-hmm. and that guy was Roman. If you say, ask a kid, who is Manibus? Who is Kesawats? Who is Glooskap? They won't know, and those are American. Those are American equivalents of Hercules. These were guys that were, you know, slaying monsters and, and you know, uh, you know, kind of laid the foundation for native civilization according to the myths. And uh, even, you know, the, the myths themselves, they're I, – I, I'm going to be careful when I say myth because yeah. uh, they're, they're in between myth and memory. And that's, I, I wrote that in the, in the book because there are so many stories that, that it, it, the line blurs, you know. One of my favorite stories that I heard from my grandmother concerns her grandmother uh, named Totsana. Mm-hmm. And the story goes, uh, when Totsana was a little girl, they were attacked by the Osage, and their warriors lost, the Kawa, the Kawa warriors lost. So all that was left in the camp were the old people, the children, and the women, and they were running away. They could see the dust plumes and the Osage coming to finish them off, and uh, this was spring. So they got to a river, and the river was swollen. There was water. You know, they couldn't really cross. And the old chief was, I'm going to go first. So he went across, and he went under, and all the people started wailing because they thought he was dead. But then he came up, and he he rose out of the water, and he was saying, Hey, ma, hey, ma, that means, you know, follow me, come here, you know. And they started walking across the water, but they were on something. And it took them across the other side of the river. And when they got over, a big fishtail came out and slapped the water. You know, as a kid, I was like, whoa, you know, that just, that just, you know, and Totsana told my grandmother this story, and she said whatever we were standing on was really soft, you know. Yeah. So, like I said, it's, 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 a, it's a fine line between, you know, history and, and, and myth, you know, that, that kind of that gray area, and that's what I tried to, to cover in the book. I see. Um, you know, with a lot of people, um, even though they say it's like that, that, there's that fine line, I mean, to me, I think it's history. You know, I mean, I mean right, of course, a lot right. of people will say myth, but yeah, to me, I mean, after hearing all the stories that, you know, we have from my, um, from my cousins, from my aunt, from my mom, from my grandma, you know, when they right. hear, when you hear the same thing and from, you know, friends that are older, you start beginning to believe that that happened. You know, they all hear right. about it, you know, it's going to happen, you know, it, let, and let's get back to the uh, book, you know, um, you know, whenever, um, that, um, that research, you know, uh, I know you had to go into a lot of research to do this. And like you said, like, you know, whenever you looked into that, the Enchanted, that was kind of dry. But uh, with this research, it's not really, you can't just go to a library and do an Internet right. search. You can't do, go and look into, I mean, even in the, like the old time of the card catalog. Right, right. You know, how, how was the research uh, to be able to get this book going? I think there were there were doors open for me that probably weren't open for you know like a professor or an anthropologist or whatever because I'm native and I think the, the big thing with our people and I think it's universal is we enjoy sharing you know and I think you know it's not just me going to recorder and saying hey tell me a story rather it's me sharing a story and then the individual would share a story with me and some of the stories I couldn't record you know some people ask me not to not to put this down which you know I totally respect 
Mm-hmm. But the thing I found interesting is that there are so many similarities, even though there are, in some cases, you know, thousands or hundreds of miles between the tribes. I, mean, I was uh, I was coming from uh, Omaha with a basketball player named Corey Ladson, and he's Crow. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were t- just telling stories, and, and he told a Crow story, and I was like, hey, he said, I know that story. That's a Kiowa story. And then I told a story, and he knew this. He knew the same story, you know. And a lot of our words were the same. And we, you know, come to find that, you know, the the Kiowa, the Crow, you know, they're they're, they're from the same branch, you yeah. know. So, in a way, you know, we all we all are related in some way, you know. Exactly, you know, with um, you know a lot of when he said like a lot of people told you not to record. Uh, was that some of the adversity that you uh, met up with whenever um, you asked them to tell you more about it, or? Um, was there any other type of version? Did people just flat out tell you, like, uh, no, I'm not going to talk about that or anything like that? Or a couple, a couple times that happened, and that was, and and that's, and I totally get it because there are, um, as you know too, there are some things that are that are taboo. And there's a, uh, I broke the, the book down into uh, the first chapter was about giants, lords of the earth. The second chapter was about the water, uh, water monsters. The third one though was about uh, the little people, and or is about the little people, and it's called Masters of Wood and Water. That one, I had some people tell me some stories that I, you know, I was kind of like, okay, they, they, they were, uh, they were a little uh, hesitant to, to delve into it more. Mm-hmm. And even my part of Oklahoma, where I grew up, you know, the belief in, and you know, uh, little people are strong, but there's something you can't go out and record and, and say in, in, you know, around a lot of non-natives, you know, because yeah. they look at you like you're crazy, like what, you know. So you have to be, you have to be careful. And I was very careful about respecting their privacy, and then. You know, uh, being a little bit more general about the information that I put out there. The last chapter, uh, the servants of evil. That's the one that was uh, that was a, an interesting one. That was about witchcraft and uh, still relatively strong in Indian country, depending on where you are. And and I was told, you know, if if I tell these stories, to do it in the winter time. And you know, and this was you know in Ute country, I was told this and. And, you know, that's, like, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to release the book in November, you know, yeah. in December when it's a little cooler, you know, to, to be respectful to, to the people that told me these, some of these stories and, you know, and, and just, just, you know, for myself. You know, that's amazing to hear. I mean, knowing that uh, not only can you, I mean, you're going to release it, but you got to release it at a certain time. I mean, so, you know, nothing, I would say, I mean, nothing can come back, you know, or go after right. you, you know. And, you know, that kind of rolls into my next question. Have you ever came apart uh, or come upon... Um, I don't know um, when they're re- if you're recording these stories, writing them down. Has uh, there been like any mischief? Like maybe the recording was erased, or maybe um, you know maybe whatever you wrote down was gone. You know something oh. like that that was kind of like uh, delaying you from being able to uh, get more research into it. No, nothing like that. I mean, certainly there's some stories I have recorded that that you know I. <laughs> You know, if I listen to them at night if I'm writing, I'll, I'll watch some cartoons afterwards. Or I'll watch some, you know, Family Guy or something <laughs> yeah. funny to kind of get my mind off. Yeah. Because there's some scary stuff out there. Yes, I mean, that's there just is. Kind of, you know, you know, that's just kind of, you know, uh, you know. And I think too, natives for the most part are natural storytellers. So you know, I've I've had a chance to meet some really good storytellers, and and you know, and they, it's scary. You know, <laughs> you listen to some of this stuff. You know, so. Nothing, nothing supernatural like that, but, you know, certainly, you know, kind of make the hair on the back of your neck stand up, listen to some of these stories. Kind of makes you think more into it. Yeah, and, you know, that kind of reminds me, you know, that time that we did go to Towak, um, there was a, uh, and I did my research on this, too, for some unknown reason, I don't know why, but it was that highway that we were going. You remember when we had right. to hit that ship rock? That you remember, remember. What, yeah, you remember what that highway was called? It was called the Devil's Highway or something right. like that. Yeah. And I remember the story that we were all telling each other. Remember, it was we we drove all through the night, and it was like you know two or three in the morning. And there was that one story about the, um, if I'm not mistaken, you might correct me if I'm wrong, but it was like the Skinwalkers, and they're right. saying like people would see those jumping from like uh, you know uh, de- uh, truck to truck. Right. You know, right. And, no, yeah, you're right. And uh, remember, I, I think I remember after we told uh, you were telling us that. I remember we. Stop. We had to take a break. I remember we had to like throw water on our face to make sure we stayed away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, and I, you know, and and you know, I, I'm trying to be careful with with that. You know, with 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 the skinwalker because that's still, uh, again, depending on where you are and mm-hmm. what you believe, it's still very strong. You know, and and it's obviously very strong out west and even even in again in Ute country um, where we were yes. when I first went to uh, Fort Duchesne in Utah uh, to play a tournament. 
Uh, the reservation is just like any other reservation. It's just like a little township with houses. But about 300 yards away from the houses are more yard lights. And it just feels out there. There's nothing out there. And I remember asking our sponsor, you know, so why are those lights out there? And he goes, well, I'll tell you guys later. And we're like, oh, okay, cool. And uh, <laughs> we, had a ha- we had a house to ourselves. And he said, all right, you know, you guys, you know, you, know, you play your video games, watch sports and whatever. If you hear something knock on the windows, don't look. If you hear somebody knock on the door, if they don't say anything, don't open the door. And that was it. He walked off. We were all looking at each other like, what? You know? Yeah. So that was kind of the, the beginning of, of, you know, of, of me learning about, about, you know, that for witchcraft. And the reason they had those lights out there was because for, you know, years they'd been bothered by this, by these, you know, this, this stuff. So the lights kept them away from the homes. Mm, so, yeah. you know, it, it's still very strong in, in certain parts of the country, in Indian country. You know, and it's one of those like things like whenever they tell you that, even though you're saying what, it was like you still don't want to ask why, right. you know. <laughs> It was one of right. those situations. I mean, I mean, and uh, you know, it was something like that. You know, and it, you probably put, uh, you know, those stories. Uh, it was like, uh, we, you know, we prepared for it. I mean, I remember uh, if uh, we did the arrowhead in the shoe. Right. right we did right. that just, uh, just for that, uh, you know, just for that drive. And right. um, it was just trying to be on the safe side about that. You know, let's uh, go ahead and get back to the, um, to the book real quick. Um, you know, with. Uh, you saying you've been all over, you know, you play basketball, so you're able to get these uh, stories. Like, tell, uh, is there like, you know, uh, maybe, um, maybe is there like a certain like a, a story that just sticks to your mind or uh, that you're willing to tell? Or uh, do we have to read the book? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, and the, the thing is, too, you know, this, this is actually this book. The first one is actually the part it's, it's part one of five. I mean, I'd collected so many stories and I, I, I was going to try to do one big tome, mm-hmm. but it would have taken me another eight years. That's, that was a crazy. I broke it up. But um, the stories that 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 stick with me the most are actually the ones from my, my grandmother. Um, she used to tell me that same day stories and same day is the Kiowa trickster. Yeah, and uh, you know, and I, I I blogged about this, you know, uh, recently. Is that anytime I run across one of those stories, you know, it, it makes me think of my grandmother, and you know, she heard these stories when she was a little girl, and her grandmother heard these stories when she was a little girl, and it, and, it, and it gives me that connection, you know, to to our people going back to you know to to forever, you know, mm-hmm. and the story that I remember the most that 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 still is is you know with me. It's not a scary story, but it's it's more of a funny story. Mm-hmm. Um. I'll see. I'll try, I'll try to talk, tell it fast, but uh, no, you're good. The, the story goes: the same day was coming along. And it was a trickster, and he was hungry, and he couldn't find anything to eat. And he came across some prairie dogs, and this was west of Carnegie. This is around Rainy Mountain. Yeah, he couldn't catch them; they were too fast. So he made a teepee and he got a drum and started singing a song. And the prairie dogs came up. and was like, "Hey, what are you doing?" He said, "Oh, I'm singing a new song. It's called the Rabbit Song." You know, and and they're like, how does it go? And he said, well, I'll show you the rabbit dance if you come into the teepee with me. So they all got in the teepee with him in a circle. And he said, all right, so I want you to put your fingers above your head like bunny rabbit ears. And I want you to close your eyes. When I sing this song, I want you to jump really hard as fast as you can. So he started drumming really fast. And those prairie dogs were getting it. I mean, they were jumping around, their, you know, their hands and their, their like, little ears. He started hitting them on the head when they, when they weren't looking. Yeah. The smallest one opened its eyes and said, hey, he's hitting us on the head. And they all ran away. But that was the origin of the rabbit dance. It's still practiced today in, in Kiowa country. So, though that's the story that that will you know I'll remember until you know until forever, basically. You know, mm-hmm. so it's not so much the scary stuff that that like that holds my attention as much as those stories that that you know that that have a cultural importance. I guess you could say. Yeah, one thing leads to another. Is what it sounds like, uh, or one thing like originates another. You know, right? Uh, you know, with. Um, are there, uh, like, can you, like, name some of the places? I know you said, like, Miccosukee earlier. I know that's in Florida. Uh, right. But is there, like, other places, like, maybe, I don't know. I know we went, of course, we went to Telwalk, but is there further out west, further north, you know, or far south, uh, yeah. you know, that you've been to to be able to uh, obtain these stories? Right. I was in uh, northern California. I was at the Robertson Rancheria branch of Homo Indians. Uh, this was a while back, and that was the first time I had ever heard of uh, the Bear Doctor. Mm-hmm. The bear doctor, I guess you could say, is the equivalent of the, the, the skinwalker, is also a, a practitioner of, of the black arts. And, you know, the people were, were you know, still a little leery of, of going out in the woods by themselves. Um, farthest northwest I've gone in, in, in the, you know, the states was probably Tahola, Washington. 
mm-hmm. and that was uh, again a great experience. I was there for a speaking engagement. Uh, as far south as I've gone uh, in Texas, I've been with the Alabama Cachata in Livingston, Texas. That yeah. was the first time I heard of the Atosi, which is their word for little person. And they and, and I heard some really good stories from the Batiste family while I was down there. Um, I've been to Sant- uh, Santee Sioux in Nebraska. I've been to Lower Sioux and Upper Sioux in, Min- in uh, Minnesota. Of course, uh, Red Lake and White Earth. White Earth is from the first time I'd heard of the Wendigo. Yeah, uh, the, the true story of the of the, the Wendigo. Because if you Google Wendigo, you'll find like you know. Unfortunately, you're starting to see a lot of our myths, and legends, kind of being. Uh, commandeered by non-natives and they're using their own artistic interpretations of what they think these monsters were and so, if you look at the wendigos it looks nothing like what it really was so mm-hmm. it's been really good to actually go and hear from actual tribal members about you know their stories their culture their history and, and you know in this case they're monsters wow i mean so yeah pretty much they're tainting it tainting the story is that what you're saying right right okay. as, as accurate as possible i try to you know Whatever story I was telling, if I was telling, you know, uh, an Abenaki story, I wanted to use actual Abenaki words. So you're not going to, in this book, you'll see some words like, whoa, you have to reread it again and, you know, practice pronunciation. But that's the way it should be, though, you know. You know, real quickly, you know, um, what are you wanting to get um, out of, um, you know, having these books, you know, getting these books? And what's your overall goal with the books? I've got three. My first is to record these stories before they're gone. Um, I, I lost my grandmother in December of last year. And, you know, of course, I, I think about her often, but I wish that I'd been recording her from get go because there are so many stories, there's so much knowledge, so much wisdom that's gone forever. And every time we lose an elder, that's information that is gone. It's, it's never going to come back. So we, you know, in our generation, we've got to do our part to record as many as we can. So my hope is to inspire others to start recording and to start, you know, preserving as much of the, of the stories as they can. Mm-hmm. Um, the language, we have a lot of good programs out there where they're actually doing a good job preserving the language, but it's hard if you're not speaking on a regular. But we all remember stories. Everybody everybody remembers Jack and the Beanstalk. Everybody remembers, you know, Lord of the Rings or whatever you've read. So I think the stories is, is, is what needs to be preserved the most. I'm hoping that other, you know, writers, authors, uh, tribal members will will take a concerted effort to start preserving as many stories as possible. Yeah, I mean, and the last goal is to shine more light on on our stories because you know our stories don't get the same respect as you know Greek mythology, Roman mythology, you know Hindu, to whatever. You know, we don't have that same type of uh, of clout, I guess. And that's another goal is that it, hopefully you know academia, a new generation of academia will, will take start taking a look at what at our stories and and do a better job of of presenting them. That's great to hear, Terrell. I'm very, very uh, happy that, you know, after all these two years, all this time, you're able to get the stories. People were able to talk to you, and you are able to get these uh, books going. I'm very, very proud of you for what you've done and how you stuck with it. I mean, I know, I mean, it, you. like you said, it took a lot of years. So I know everybody's wanting to hear. I'm wanting to hear. When is the release of this book, and how can we get it? Uh, the release is going to be November 28th. It will be on Amazon.com. I'll also have a, a little link on my website, which is at www.nativetales.com. Nativetales.com, okay. Is there? Um, like, and you, talk, you talked about a blog earlier, if I'm not mistaken. Is that is that right. same with it? Okay. Yes. Okay. And, and it's just fireside chats. And, and I talk a little bit about some of the stories that I, I wasn't able to record in the book or, you know, story where I've heard them. Um, I've only got like I've only had the website up for you know I think three or four months, so I've only got a few stories on there right now. But I'll be doing at least one or two stories every month. So, you know, and and my hope is it'll grow. I'm hoping that other people will reach out to me and, and share stories with me via the blog too. So we we'll hope- see what happens. Yeah, we're hoping that as well. Uh, Terrell, we want to thank you again for being on the show. Uh, we want to. Um, we could talk about this all day, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really could. I could really just listen to these and. Uh, Hopefully we can get you back on, uh, hopefully sometime soon, and I'll be able to get an update on how everything's going, what's going to be going on with the, uh, the other books that's going to be uh, uh, coming up here pretty soon. So uh, feel free, uh, you know, just uh, give me give us a holler and uh, tell us what's going on and uh, keep us updated, please. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. No problem. This is uh, Tara Hill, everybody. His uh, book released for uh, is going to be released November 28th on uh, Amazon.com, and it's called The Age of Myths and Legends. And if I'm not mistaken, this one is part one. Uh, yes. All right. Well, Terrell, thank you again. And, uh, Terrell, you have a great afternoon. Thank you. You too.
Right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, we're going to get down to the final little bit of uh, Muskogee Radio, uh, which, of course, brings on the announcements, community announcements. Let's start it off. Men's Summit, November 17th, uh, will be from 5 to 8. It's going to be held at the Muskogee Dome in the Claude Cox Omniplex. Uh-oh, uh, everybody hearing that beeping, my bad. And I can't get rid of it. Give me one second. Okay, everybody, my apologies on that. I know everybody's probably laughing right now at me, but uh, it's okay. Um, like I said, the Men's Summit is going on November 17th from 5 to 8 at the Muskogee Dome at the Claude Cox Omniplex. Uh, traditional dinner will be provided. If I'm not mistaken, this is open to all men of the Muskogee Creek Nation. So please, for more information, contact, call 918-732-7617. Environmental Services celebrates America National Recycles Day, November 15th, and that will be at the MCN Recycling Center, 3571 Industrial Place here in Okmulgee. And um, I don't, they'll be going from, five, from 9 to uh, 12 on, uh, of course, November 15th at Green Country Shedding Company. Uh, they will not be, ex they'll be accepting electronics, cardboard, paper, bottles, and aluminum cans, but will not be accepting refrigerators, small appliances, tires, or car batteries. For more information, please contact 918-549-2580. Next is the Holiday Luncheon. December 2nd, Glenpool Conference Center from 12 to 2 is going to be for the enrolled Creek elders 55 years or older. There'll be a holiday basket bingo. You win a basket and give a basket to another elder. Sounds like fun. For more, uh, for more info on that, contact Elder Services at 918-732-7765. Next, the Muskogee Creek Nation Physical Rehabilitation Center is uh, hosting an open house. Um, That'll be, of course, November 15th as well, from 9 to noon. Um, for more information, uh, call 918-732-7632. Uh, we have a block party coming up. Uh, let's see. It'll be uh, Saturday, November 19th from 11 to 2. It's going to be a cookout, massive giveaways, pony rides, bouncy house, fun and games. And from Saturday evening from 6 to 9 will be a special presentation with Melvin Adams. Melvin Adams is a former Harlem Globetrotter. The guy's comical, you know, very funny. You know, all of those guys that from the Harlem Globe charted were, so I know he's going to be bringing a lot of great things to him. So please, uh, for more details on that one, call 918-366-6735. And uh, walk to, walking to stop diabetes is our tradition. Join us at University of Tulsa, Saturday, November 12th. Sign in at 9. The walk begins at 10. Be joined Team, Musco Team Muskogee walking and uh to get onto that one it'll be uh, go to main.diabetes.org slash go to slash muskogee hyphen walking that's a lot and i apologize uh the next one will be uh, uh what we talked about last week with the homeless reintegration homeless veteran reintegration program uh, if you are uh just for any creek citizens who are eligible for the assistance this grant provides uh, for more information on that, please contact Dina Votra, uh, the coordinator, at 918-652-2676. And that's going to wrap it up for uh, the community announcements. I want to thank Reverend Nigel Big Pond for talking about the prayer rally that he held at the, um, at the Washington, D.C., Washington Monument. And I also want to thank uh, Terrell Hill for uh, taking time out of his busy schedule as well to come talk to you about uh, his new book that came out, The Age of Myths and Legends, Part 1. That release should be coming out pretty soon. Uh, like me, I hope you're going to be looking forward to that. Uh, next week, of course, will be uh, Gary Fife will be back on the show, and he'll have a lot more great things to talk about. So we'll be looking forward to that. I want to thank you for, uh, again, you uh, listening to me uh, for these last two weeks. Uh, thank you for... Uh, all your help with that and uh, I hope you all have a great day and so please come back next week for Muskogee Radio. You've been listening to Muskogee Radio. Join us again next week for more local, tribal, and community news and updates. Middle.